Welcome to our November Users Webinar, everyone. Chuck and Taryn and I were just talking that we can't believe in one week we will be celebrating Thanksgiving. This year is dragging by and speeding by at the same time. I'm not sure how that works, but that's how I'm feeling. Anyway, in today's webinar on workshop course types, you'll enjoy both a how-to portion and a how-we demonstration. Chuck will provide an overview of workshop type courses, and Taryn from Oklahoma State University will demonstrate workshops in action, and you'll hear more about Taryn soon. Taryn and Chuck have the questions you submitted in advance for today, but one question submitted is more of a question for all of you. So I'm going to share that with you so you can think a little and respond in the chat box during their presentation, along with any questions you might have for them. And then at the end of our time together, I'll share some of the creative responses you have um, shared with everybody. But here's the question, and this came from Longwood Gardens in Pennsylvania. How do you or how are you getting people to sit through a full day of online workshops? So be thinking of that, and then we'll share your tips and tricks to keep people engaged at the end of the session. So without further ado, I'm going to let Chuck take over, type those questions in the chat box, and we'll get them to the presenters. Chuck's watching those, and I'm watching those. And so, Chuck, it's all yours. Very good. Well, thank you, Sharon. And again, we are so appreciative of Taryn uh, preparing some notes to share with us about, again, uh, workshops on, uh, on the road or in the trenches. So, Taryn, we're looking forward to that. What I want to do is kind of give a primer, if you would, a, 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 an appetizer to what uh, Taryn is going to talk about in terms of giving you an overview of workshops within Student Manager and AceWeb. And again, uh, we appreciate your feedback. About half of you that pre-registered use workshops. Uh, so for them, uh, it'll be a review. And the rest of you are new. So I'll try to give a context of that as well. So again, basic items we're going to go through, um, and then of course uh, the passé de résistance is going to be uh, Taryn, and that is again Oklahoma State, not not anything from Ohio. If you're a Buckeye fan, so um, WWWD, and so the idea: what would workshops do for you? And and that's what we're here to talk about. And basically. Uh, to me, workshops give you more buckets within a class program event to track data in. And the biggest probable use is for conferences, symposia, where you have breakout sessions during the course. I don't know how many of you might be attending uh, the Virtual Learn Conference or the Virtual CMED or any of the virtual conferences uh, that you've had um, in this fall. But a lot of them have breakout sessions. So like at 1 o'clock, there are four sessions on topic A, B, C, and D. And maybe you as a conference organizer would like to know which people or which sessions people are planning to sign up for. Now, again, in a virtual mode, it's probably way less critical than if you're actually physical again, back to if we can ever do that. Uh, because you have rooms that you have to assign people in when you're in a physical room. Uh, and again, maybe even for a virtual session, you might want to say if you've got a lot of people in one of your virtual breakouts, you would want to recruit more moderators to help with any discussion group sessions you might want to do within one of these breakout uh, time slots. Um, the other use of it is for, again, and probably related to back when we can do physical again, pre-conference or post-conference activities. So if you have a pre-conference workshop, and again, tied to the regular activity, uh, workshops allow you to track attendees for that, and you can charge for that. You can actually charge an extra fee for that. So things like a golf tournament. Uh, again, you're having a golf, uh, or golf session before or after an event you can allow workshops as a way to sign up for that. You can charge a fee or not, and it gives you a precise uh, roster, if you would, and you can set limits. Uh, you might have a limit of X 20 people who can go on a golf 
outing. That's just how many people, of course, can handle, and you can manage that. Uh, and then again, that idea of events within an event. So, and uh, the other thing we will, of course, ask you is at the end is if you've got other creative ways that you've used workshops. So um, that's what we're about. All right. What are the things about workshops? Number one that is unique. Well, number one is they have to be, workshops have to be tied to a class. So again, you got to have some class course conference set up within the student manager course screen, and then you can set up sub workshops. Uh, again, for each one of the workshop activities, you can set a limit, you can assign a fee, uh, that fee goes into additional uh, charges, you can record hours, CEUs, and a grade. You can store a description for it and special details. And you'll be interesting to hear how Taryn's done that. And of course, ACEWeb supports them. So how do you enable workshops? Well, first of all, on the course screen, you would click on the type and set that to workshop. When you do that, you get a workshop button, this one general button on the toolbar turns into workshops. Um, at that point now, you can click on the workshops button and it pops up a subscreen where you can describe this additional activity or this breakout session or this pre-conference conference or golf tournament or you know uh, canoe trip down the river that you're uh, including as part of your program activities. So one of the things about setting up workshops, like a lot of other things in life, a little advanced planning goes a long way in making sure you're set up for success. Number one is deciding what your code for the workshop will be. And we recommend for a best practice that you have your workshop code set up typically into three sets of characters. The first set of characters would be the day that the program is held on, that the workshop falls on, falls into. The second set would be the time frame. The third set of characters would be the session during that time period. Uh, you want to note that uh, the demo we're looking at here only uses one digit per one of these characteristics. You can actually use two or three digits, but that your maximum on this is, is that eight digit limit within the workshop code setup. So here is an example of a pro forma uh, set of workshops within a program. So here is the Thursday schedule. We're going down chronologically down the page. 9.30 to 9.50, we have A. We have day one is A, day one is A, day one is A. The second letter is the session. A is the first session, B is the second session, C is the third, D is the fourth, et cetera. And then within the session, 9.30 to 9.50, you have session one, two, and three. Uh, and then ditto, we go to day two. Day two is day is B. Then we have B, session, come back to me, session A, A for the first, session one, session two, B, B for the second session of the second day, session one, session two. Now again, as we said earlier, you're not restricted to just using one letter for these characteristics, but basically whatever you use for the first set of letters that represents the day, you're gonna wanna use the same number of letters for day two. So if you actually, Thursday and Friday don't work for using alphabetical letters of the day of the week, but if you had a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday workshop, uh, MON, comes before uh, alphabetically uh, at the first of the time period. And again, this is uh, down at the back. Well, let me, let me kind of review this again as to why we're doing this. Workshops can be sorted by day, time, and session. And again, by using proper coding, it's easier to look at a workshop and figure out what one they're working with. And by using this consistent coding, you can restrict the number of workshops, or you can keep people from double enrolling during one breakout session. Uh, in other words, at 10 o'clock on Monday, you can't enroll in three workshops because you can only be at one at one time. 
I guess virtually, maybe you could with three anyway. Uh, in AceWeb, it makes it easier to set up selections. And again, that comment about having that code chronological so that, again, uh, workshops beginning with this letter will be the first chronological set of workshops. Then you have the Bs. Whoa, I, keep, I have a jumpy mouse here. Uh, let's go one more. There we go. Um, so that you, but again, if you, if it's like a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we were saying you could put MON for Monday, TUE for Tuesday, and WED for Wednesday. By chance, that would chronologically sort, so M before T and T before W. Thursday, Friday, Saturday doesn't work so well. So the idea of needing to use an alpha letter or a number letter to indicate the sequence of those workshops so that they, they would be chronological. All right, again, as always, questions, chat them, in the, chat them in the chat box, type them in the chat box. Type them in the type box, chat them in the chat box. I'm struggling with that, uh, guys. Okay, setting up the workshop itself. So you've opened the course, set it to workshop, clicked on the workshop button, and you get the workshop setup screen. Well, what, what can you do with that? Well, number one, you can add a catalog description to it. So this description info links to your catalog table. So you can put in a full description for that course. Uh, you can set the maximum number of students in the class or in this particular workshop. Uh, you can add extra detail, option one, option two, if there is uh, if there's a reason you want to add other detail about a workshop, you can. Those are user defined or define them, and you can do that on a event by event basis. You don't have to always have opt one being uh, your institution type and opt two being number of years of experience. You could um, you could have it for different purposes for different uh, courses or, or conferences that you're running workshops for. And then finally, I think the big thing is that you can add a fee to this workshop. So if there are premium activities during a program, you're going to have a, a whiskey tasting or a, a, a cheese tasting um, program, and you're going to need to charge a little extra if people want to go to that, you could do that. All right. So that was from setting up the course. Now from student manager, the back office, how do you assign workshops? Well, you'd register the person for the course, click the assign workshop button, and then you'll get the list of workshops for this course. As a staff member, you just type in what it is that you, or you check the box for the program uh, that, you're, that the person is signing up for. Um, workshop. Uh, workshops that a person has selected then will appear down in this little workshop window and if you registered that person for a workshop that has a fee that fee would drop into the description now again uh, this is generic additional charge but you certainly can go in and put in uh, description fees that are more illustrative of what it is ie wine tasting or a golf tournament uh, just create the fee to ma match that description. How are we doing, Sharon? Questions? We doing good? You're doing good. All right. So now let's go back to the course setup. Uh, what are what are the kind of things you can do once you're working with workshops within a course or activity? Number one, uh, you're able to email people in a given workshop. So again, if you've got a workshop leader that has some people pre-registered, um, they can, uh, now I don't believe they can do that from AceWeb. So this would have to be a staff thing on from student manager, but you can go into, um, you know, when you can shoot a note to Cheryl, make sure you, uh, I, I don't think we can do that, Sharon. Uh, but again, uh, from, the, from the student manager side, you can go in, uh, click on the email students, and basically, you'll get an email blast similar to what you get from the quick report screen. Uh, and then the other is a list of students where you just want to see the names of the students in that particular workshop. All right, I don't see any questions yet. And then, of course, finally, edit grades, CEUs, and hours if you, um, <clears throat> if you want to, uh, or if you are tracking grades, CEUs, and hours. 
Um, all right. Uh, now we're going to pivot over to a single registration. So once you have um, once you have created the workshops and you set them up and you're editing, if you if you need to edit the registration for somebody who's in workshops, you can click on the Edit Workshops button, and that allows you to edit the grades, the hours attended, and any kind of dates, uh, date entered, date completed for a particular uh, workshop participation for one particular student. Um, if you have a student who, again, you, you want to drop out of a workshop, uh, you click on the Assign Workshops button, even though they're already assigned, but it does pop up that uh, Select Workshop menu, and you can uncheck uh, to remove or click to add a new workshop. Now, note, um, if the maximum size is set uh, from student manager, you'll be prompted just like enrolling in a class that is, says it's full. Uh, but with the proper permission, you do you are able to override and overbook if if you want. Now, one of the nice things about the workshop element is that when you have a workshop that is full. Matthew highlights that full workshop in red so that you get kind of a heads up that these workshops are currently unavailable. Or if you're going to book them, you got to you got to double book them on that. So, all right. Again, guys, if you've got questions, feel free to pop them up. Otherwise, we'll uh, do it at the end. Reporting. All right. Well, uh, from the reports menu, you've got a couple of report areas. You can generate rosters or certificates, which allows you to look at the individual rosters of all of the workshop subgroups within a given course. And the second report area is enrollment summary, which gives you basically a um, how do you say, forest level view where you could see a given course and then how many people are enrolled in each breakout workshop. In other words, uh, deans and directors is 12 and beginning uh, program planning is three, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one of the things that we offer to help you with the reporting, and we're kind of glossing over this because we'll, uh, this gets into when you're actually doing the de devil in the details of how exactly you might want these workshops to work for you, but that uh, there are a number of functions that allow you to, um, again, put workshop information in reports, put workshop information on a confirmation email or a follow-up email. Uh, so again, um, you, you kind of look through these if you go to the help guide, you can look up one of these, and of course, it'll give you related uh, related uh, functions that, that work in this area. Um, there's more. Count the number of workshops a person is enrolled in. Uh, returns workshops from multiple courses where a certain person is enrolled. It's kind of a cross-course routine. Showing a listing of all the workshops set up for a course. If you're running a report, in Student Manager and you want to see what workshops are on a course, you can basically add those workshops to pretty much any course report you've got in the system. List work, uh, list workshops for an individual's registration. Now what that is handy for is that you can use that in confirmations. So again, uh, this is an example of an email confirmation using the list work which shows what workshops uh, that student has registered for. Now I'm going to actually segue. We're, we're I'm ahead of t on the time frame. You guys are panting here. Good Lord, he's going fast. So just I'm going to slow down a bit and bring up the help guide because uh, one of the things uh, ELP help online help under uh, workshop functions. So if I were to look up list work and I'm going to do it within reporting functions. One of the nice things that um, Cheryl and Jason have done with the help guide is that when you pick a function, okay, you say, well, this is list work. It's one of the work. Oh, but that's not really, I really want something a little different. 
If you go down to the bottom where it says related topics, you can click on that and it'll show you all of the other functions that are related to this. So again, it's a way to cross-reference all of the other workshop, uh, all of, well, in this case, we're looking at workshops, but it's a way for you to cross-reference all of the functions dealing with a particular topic area that you might be searching for in the, in the help guide. Okay, let's get back to the to the webinar. All right, so we've got the um, talked about list work, um, other types of reports using workshops. You can have a make a sign in roster, workshop tickets, workshop badges, workshop certificates, personal schedules, all of those things available. Now, we're going to take a couple of slides on AceWeb, and Taryn, you're, we're going to get you ready, get your tap shoes on. You're just about ready to go on. So um, one of the things we want to note is that on our AceWeb portal sandbox, uh, we've got several examples, a couple examples of courses with workshops. Uh, if you go in there, click on examples, you'll be able to go in, sign up for one, and kind of see how it's being displayed on AceWeb. Um, so again, to set up in AceWeb, uh, once you've set up the courses and that they're set to publish, you can put in a workshop message on this. You also can indicate a minimum number of workshops or a maximum number of workshops they're able to, to sign up for. I think there was a question about, well, we'll, we'll skip that question for now. We'll get it under questions. Um, minimum and maximum. And again, if you set a minimum, uh, your student will not be able to complete the registration online unless they have selected, in this case, at least six workshops. Um, and again, you can set up workshops to not display on AceWeb. Again, kind of like the non-published course in Student Manager. But if there's a reason you want to have a workshop for staff use only just from the Student Manager view, you can check that box, do not display in AceWeb. Well, Sharon, I don't see any questions. I think everybody is excited to get to Taryn. So I'm going to turn it to you and let you swap the control. Will do. I want to tell everybody that Taryn is a part of the Center for Local Government Technology team at Oklahoma State University. She is the AceWare Keeper of the Flame. And we at Aceware appreciate her strong leadership in that role. She embraces challenges, as you will hear as she tells her story. And one note, as I turn controls over to her, the picture that you see here was taken at our last Aceware face-to-face conference in 2019 in Vegas. And that seems like a lifetime ago to me, but we sure look forward to returning to the in-person meeting. Taryn, thanks so much for being willing to join us today and share your success story. It is all you're, yours. You're welcome. Are you able to see my screen? We are seeing your screen. Okay. You're okay. not in presenter mode. We're seeing like multiple slides. Okay. Perfect. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, hopefully some of the information I share will be useful to you guys. Um, 2020 has definitely been an interesting year. I know it's brought about a lot of changes in a lot of programs and we were no exception. Um, historically, all of our classes are held in person. So we really don't do any webinars. We didn't do any Zoom classes or meetings. Um, mm -hmm. So when the university shut down, that was a big game changer. We still had classes that needed to take place and we still had people um, that, you know, needed these courses for their jobs or for different various reasons. And we had to figure out a way to get things done. Um, our team tried out a lot of different softwares. We liked Zoom best. And from there, we started hosting classes on Zoom. Um, this led to a conference that is normally hosted in person. They figured out, oh, they can do this via Zoom. Let's see if they can help us. So I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but that that kind of sets the stage for how we ended up where we are. 
um, in the past, because our classes were all held in person, uh, we typically weren't worried about a lot of these virtual aspects. Um, our clients do register via ACEWeb. However, our our classes would workshop for really one or two conferences a year, um, and we entered the workshop information after the fact. So for this particular workshop example, um, people would, it's a district meetings, there's four different districts and they're held all over the state. And we would basically, after all the meetings had taken place, we would get the attendance roles and enter in everyone's specific area that they attended. And this person attended all four and it would it would change. A lot of people only attended a few, but it was just a way to keep up with everyone and give them credit for their transcripts and their professional CEO hours that they're keeping up with. Um, like I said, typically it, it was never something displayed on the web. It was never anything other than us doing some internal tracking. Up until 2020, when about two weeks before the conference would have taken place, we got a call that said, hey, we really don't want to cancel. We really don't think it's safe to have this event in person. Can you help us? Well, we said yes. <laughs> we didn't quite know what we were getting ourselves into. But, you know, the truth is, is that it all worked out. I work with a really awesome team. And there's a lot of people that have been using Student Manager for quite a while. We also have a pretty tech savvy team as far as the Zoom side of things. And they're always looking to implement new technology which is a major, major help. Um, the event we organized was a two and a half day conference. We had 37 different workshops over the two and a half days. And after it was over, basically we needed to do tracking for all the participants because it all goes towards their professional hours. Um, what you're seeing now is how our course for this event typically looked. Um, very basic, just normal course. It didn't even, in the past, it wasn't even used as an online registration. We built the course and then would add people in after the event was over. Um, and we would get CEU sheets from the Oklahoma Tax Commission and we store those. So we have our database files and our hard copy files. And this is what someone's registration would look like. They would set a certain amount of hours for each breakout session. We would be given that list. Um, and then people would be able to send in their CEU sheets. We would enter them based on how many attendant breakout sessions they attended. Um, you'll notice I, I did this these two slides on purpose because one thing I figured out after we were doing things with workshops was on people's transcripts as we printed them and in their registration note here, um, you would have a description of everything they went to rather than just knowing that this person attended for six hours, this person attended for 15. I think it's really neat to be able to go back and look at what they attended. And I think that that will help some of our um, clients too, to be able to have that on their transcript to know what they went to. It could vary from year to year. They could pick based on that fact for future conferences. So the first thing we did was talk in our planning was talk about the fact that we had two weeks to put this conference on we knew that we wanted to give everyone about a week to register so that means we really had a week to figure out what the heck we were going to do and how we were going to do it um we quickly decided after some research and i'm going to do a plug for aceware even though they didn't ask me to their online um help is so amazing i use those archives from the webinars, I use the forum, it's great. Also, our tech is great. He was instrumental in this process. Um, I probably drove him nuts. I had a million questions a day and he was so patient and great through it all. So a big thank you to Joe. We could not have done it without him. Um, all we did was clone our workshop from the previous, or clone our course from the previous year and change the type to workshop. So that is all very similar, just changing the dates and things like that. Um, Chuck touched on it earlier with the coding. That is huge. It makes a huge difference in your ACEWeb display. It makes a huge difference in everything, truthfully. Um, this is just for the first day, as you can see, we did um, just basic numbers. 
And our ATAP manager, who this conference was going through, is the one who built all this and coded it. Um, we did basically numbers and changed the second number for every time we had a session change. Also, I'm going to back up and make this note here. Um, we did use the workshop itself to enter our Zoom links. And it kind of becomes more applicable later, as you'll see, but we wanted to be able to make sure that everyone got their Zoom link attached to their specific breakout sessions that they registered for, rather than just receiving a giant page of Zoom links that they would have no clue what this was. This is how our display looked online. Uh, 37 breakout sessions is a lot. It was a lot to manage. Um, and it can be a little daunting, but the best part was the drop down boxes when you actually entered your enrollment cart. Um, they were chronological. I didn't end up getting a screenshot during the time of what the drop down looked like, but it was basically the courses listed for each time slot. Um, makes a huge difference when organizing things. And that all goes back to the coding. It really is very important. So, the biggest problem, I won't say problem, I guess hurdle we had to overcome um, while troubleshooting all of this on our end for the conference was how we were going to get the Zoom links out to everyone. Um, like the note that was in the workshop earlier, we talked to Joe about it and realized that's the thing. As long as the link was 120 characters or less, I believe. Um, however, we ran. We, we got our course built. We, you know, ran a registration and thought, huh, that's interesting. <laughs> Nothing shows up. So back to the online forum, like I said, that's a huge, huge help. We quickly figured out where to enter the workshop information so that at least your um, sessions registered for showed up. And when after we could not figure out how to get the Zoom links, that's where Joe came in handy. Um, I did not put a screenshot of this, but in order to get the workshop notes to display, you actually have to change the code in your INI settings. I did it from um, Ace Web in the Template Manager, basically your Ace Web administration page, and you go to your Template Manager and you edit the settings for your workshop and registration notes. Um, all we had to do was add in one simple line of code. It's funny how one little line of code can get you so tripped up. But like I said, thanks to Joe, he made it a snap. Another way to do this is you can actually go in and edit the hard file on your web server. Um, I actually don't have access to ours, so I do everything through the manager online. Um, one thing I will say is that when you do this, it does change it for all your templates, so be sure that that's okay with whoever else is using the program or that's going to have workshops, because when you change it in one place, it does change it everywhere. For us, it was an okay and needed change, but that might not be the case for everyone. After our Zoom links did show up, this is kind of what it looked like. Um, each Zoom link was displayed out beside the class registration. In the future, we'll probably go in and do some more formatting because we were doing this on the fly in such a short amount of time. Um, we were just ecstatic that we got the links to display. <laughs> um, so we weren't too concerned about the formatting. And, and a lot of our people that were attending are very used to looking at stuff like this. So we knew if they had questions, they would call and let us know. In addition to this, we also would send out links the day before each session, the evening before the next sessions would start. And we really utilized the email students in the particular workshop area to do that. And that was really handy rather than having to email the whole class. You could literally just get those people registered in that particular workshop. So that kind of brings us to where we are now. While we were working through all of this, um, we kind of got the idea that there might be some other places we could implement workshops. Um, our 
2020 fall classes were held once the university gave um, permission to go in person again. We still have a lot of people that had health concerns and we completely understood that and wanted to be as accommodating as possible. So our classes were held simultaneously in person and on Zoom. Um, the problem that we were running into with this, and we usually have around 60 people in our classes, is that our instructors were literally having to call 60 people to say, hey, how are you coming? In person, in Zoom? Um, for the Zoom attendees, we have to mail out material ahead of time. So it you kind of had to do some planning ahead. It, it gets kind of daunting. Um, it was just a normal class with a normal class build. This is how it all typically looks. But I still wanted to give an example so that you guys would be able to see the changes. Um, from doing the workshops, we kind of thought, well, I wonder if, which is always a fun statement, if we could make people register according to workshops. And that is what we are doing for our 2021 classes. And they're already open for enrollment and it's working really well. Um, when you register, you have to register either as attending online or attending Zoom. Oh, I got a little bit ahead of myself. This is our confirmation for those classes in the past. So moving on to the 2021 courses, we did change the type to a workshop. All we did was clone our previous classes. Um, we are definitely making use of the fact that you can limit your workshop registrations and that you can set, our, our worry was that people would log on and complete a registration without actually selecting a workshop. And the workshop, was the main part. That was the most important thing we really needed to know. Um, again, talking to Joe, he assured us that all of our concerns were, were possible to troubleshoot. And so I don't have a screenshot of it, but we do use that portion that says you must register for at least one workshop. Um, when, if someone tries to complete registration without checking, without selecting a workshop, they will get an error message and be taken back to the same screen. We were really worried that classes would fill up and that, for instance, someone would want to attend in person and we're very limited on space in our venue for the spring 2021 and that they would still go ahead and register. Well, this way they can't. They know they have to take a Zoom class and or they can contact us to be on the waiting list while still for the in-person while still being registered for Zoom. Um, this is how our workshops look for this 2021 class. We only have two workshops as we're only concerned about figuring out which route a person wants to take. Um, because of our space, each is limited to 30. And that limitation for the in-person, it really matters. It's, it's a much smaller space than what people are used to. And social distancing really takes up a lot of space when you do it correctly. Um, you'll notice on these, we do not have the Zoom links in the notes, um, just simply because those links haven't even been generated yet. We're looking at classes that are going to happen from basically January to July of 2021. So our instructors will send those out to the appropriate people, usually a day or two before the class starts. And I'm not sure how they plan on doing it. They may go ahead and utilize the um, Zoom portion workshop to do it there. They may go ahead and send it to the whole class in case someone changes their mind. Um, we haven't quite worked that part out yet. It's a work in progress. So I did include the difference in the two registrations. Here we're looking at a registration for someone who wants to attend in person. And I included a screenshot of that edit screen just so people would know what it looks like. And the same here with someone registered via Zoom, only it is in the assigned workshop. So if they called and changed their mind, we would be able to switch the registrations really easily using this screen. Um, and these are just some quick examples of the differences in the confirmation. Like I said, on this time, we weren't worried about getting the Zoom link on here, but we did want them to know hey, you're registered, and you did register in person, 
we knew we would get phone calls if it didn't say anything. So in both cases, it tells you kind of where you're at and what you're doing. Um, I will say that one thing I did not mention about the conference portion, kind of backtracking, was that um, the biggest hurdle, and we, we really didn't have many after registrations were live and we got things going, um, you know, we registered 482 people successfully pretty much over the course of two or three days. We had a few last minute people, you know, morning of, day before, that sort of thing, as everybody does, I'm sure. But for the most part, uh, things went pretty smoothly. Basically, the, the only problem that we had was people, what we called course hopping or session hopping, because it was Zoom, they wanted to, you know, oh, I registered for this, but I would like to change it to that. Again, you can easily do that in that edit screen. They are not allowed to do it on AceWeb. So they do have to call in, which actually we liked because we were tracking the CEUs. Um, I will say this for people having a million breakout sessions with Zoom. I made myself a master list so I could easily email out new Zoom links to those who called and needed to change session. Um, I did not include any reports for the conference because really the only thing we used, and it was very rudimentary, was just the name um, roster because we kind of did a little attendance, even though we had CEU sheets to verify where people were and when, um, we did a little attendance of our own while we were sitting in the session. And that kind of brings me to the end of things. I am sure there are things I left out, but I would I would like to say also that the things we did in the short amount of time were extremely rudimentary. Um, this, you guys, does not even scratch the surface. But as I was talking with Sharon before we started, some of these capabilities are so detailed. It is very impressive. In just the short amount of time I had to research before we hosted this conference, um, it, it is wild what all you can accomplish. So if you think, oh, you know, this stuff is, it's okay, but they didn't really do that much with it. If you have more detailed stuff, don't be afraid to ask about it because the capabilities are pretty endless. Very good. We have a question here um, sure. from an attendee. Did you have a different fee for the in-person versus the online registrations? And if so, how would you denote that? So we actually did not. And um, I will back up and do a little history here. We have changed over as of 2019 to none of our classes. Um, for the particular program that I work with have fees. This conference has held in person. It's put on by the Oklahoma Tax Commission, so it actually would have a fee, um, but they very kindly waived the fees for everyone to attend via Zoom, which was really awesome because I think there were a lot of people, um, this conference is attended by county government employees, their assessors, and the assessor's personnel and um, office staff. So I think there's a lot of people that got to attend that wouldn't normally get to because of, you know, it, it's very expensive for your whole office to travel. Um, if you did have that, and Chuck may be able to help out more as well, I believe there, there are definitely places in the workshop that you can denote the fees um, and they would show up on your registration um, emails if you have it coded that way. Um, and then, of course, your normal invoicing route, I'm sure, would still work. Uh, uh, Taryn, thank you. Uh, excellent, excellent session. Um, can I tag team on that last question from Laura Lee? Um, I, I, I actually am, am doing dual. I've got three workshops going on this week. Uh, Learn, a group called Conference and Event Directors. You want to turn me on to the program or put me back to uh, the uh, conference. Anyway, one of the things about charging differently for um, for online versus in person, I've had, there were several people at the other session, these are executive ed groups, 
that say they do not charge a difference. They don't want to dilute the fee or the value of their on of their of their offering, whether it's online or in person. And so they they don't change a different fee. Now, uh, there's a couple of things I wanted to bring up here. Number one, on fees. Um, as, let me go back to as what uh, Taryn is saying. On Taryn's example, if she wanted to have a, a regular registration fee, uh, these are, I've got to get the, if they wanted to have a regular registration fee of X amount, $100, on one of the programs, on the other program, they could have a different fee, $75, uh, or you could even leave it the same number of dollars if you just need to go in, like in Terrence's case, are you gonna show up in person? So like this one might be, again, in person, on site, and the other workshop would be uh, via Zoom, you know? And again, you can choose to set up a fee once they select which option they want. The other way to do that is to use the new fee uh, limit capability on a registration fee. So like a lot of people who have hybrid classes, they might say, well, we're gonna run this class on campus and it has a maximum of 15 people in the classroom, but we're gonna also make that fee available via Zoom and we can have up to 100 people in our Zoom account. So by setting up two different fees, uh, one you'd probably say registration fee uh, on site. In other words, edit that fee. Let's go ahead and do that. Reg fee on site. So basically you define a fee that is uh, an on site fee of X amount and you can put the limit based on your classroom size and then you can have as many as you want for the Zoom fee and again, you can choose to either charge the same amount or to use an alternate fee. So hopefully that helps and, and again, Taryn, I don't, in, in your case, are those courses free that you're dealing with those other, uh, the ones where you're trying to decide hybrid or they fee? Yes, are they, they are. They're free. So again, if even if they are free, you could put in a, a dollar amount of zero. Uh, the same dollar amount on a, any number of fees is fine as long as the description is different and be able to have people just pick a fee when they're enrolling uh, or pick an option when they're enrolling and that will uh, help you again manage those programs. So um, very good. Other questions for, for Taryn here about how you're doing it? Um, this idea of, again, putting in the Zoom links on your workshops, uh, I mean, that's a, that's a great idea. Uh, we've got some folks who are doing this for classes that are all Zoom, is that instead of putting it, instead, they don't do workshops, but what they do is go into this comments printed on the receipt, and they'll put in Zoom uh, logon info they'll put that in the notes to be printed on the receipt, and then that will automatically uh, go into the person's receipt, so. Sharon, so we, we actually question? do the same thing um, okay. with our classes normally. <laughs> I got kind of nervous and talked right through some of my <laughs> notes, but um, we utilize that a lot, and the reason we didn't do that in the conference was just because there were so many links and we thought it would be really right. confusing but we utilize that right. area um basically with every class be it attachments yeah. or zoom yeah. links or information it's a great great tool right right well like again for a single class where you don't have all those breakout sessions that be unique that that'd be different than of course your unique case with that uh with that other one here so um there was a question Tracy asked about, well, how do you count in the case of workshops? How do you count uh, like workshops uh, compared to the main reporting? And again, I, I, it's not all sure. Again, I don't know exactly, Tracy, where you're coming from, but generally the enrollments in the program are going to be handled at 
the mother course level. In other words, those are enrollments in the program. And then again, what your workshops do is tell you that for a given student, for Michael Boyd, he's going to be attending these sub events. Now, again, if you were to go to um, these programs, if you were doing our tracking at the workshop level, separately from the hour tracking at the mother course level, in other words, your, your hours here, there are functions, this is getting into slicing and dicing as to how exactly you're managing your, your hours for a, a program that might have breakout workshops. And I know professional programs, uh, optometry would, might be one where you've got breakout sessions and you're trying to add up all of the breakout sessions to come up with a, a, a total final number of how many hours some student participated. There are functions that allow you to do that and there are some preferences in the edit preferences where, and I forget, uh, recalculate enrollment and maybe it's on register. It's basically whether or not you use, here it is, role workshop CEUs to registration CEUs. So, Again, you have to, like uh, we said in the PowerPoint, you have to plan ahead to know how you're going to track those hours, uh, but there are some tools to help you help you roll those up. Questions, Sharon? I have a couple of things I want to clarify, but um, nothing, nothing else. Well, a couple of things I had mentioned or we had mentioned about whether or not a staff member could go in online excuse me, whether a instructor could go in online and email their students. Our trusty web helper, Cheryl, says absolutely. But if you allow your instructors to, uh, if you allow your instructors to log in and edit their programs, you can allow them to email people in a workshop. So uh, that is uh, something that is available. What was the, oh, the other thing I wanted to show, and that is, um, Taryn, you had it displayed on your uh, workshop breakout so that when you when people selected a workshop, what it showed was it said uh, workshops in the checkout, but it didn't give the time of the workshop. One of the things you can do is have your tech help you edit this display so that instead of saying just select a workshop, you can also add to it the date and the time of the workshop. Now, the nice thing is that also displays down inside the selection box so that, um, you know, if a person is signing up for workshops, she knows, well, I know that I'm, I have to attend five. Uh, I'm busy over the noon hour. That's Eastern time. So I'm going to enroll in everything except this particular set of workshops without having to open and go inside and, and look at it. So, so, Karen, what other things you're thinking about? And now you said, oh, I wanted to say this and wanted to say that. Um, oh, goodness. Well, and of course, now I'm kind of at a loss. I'm looking at my notes on all the things we, we really lacked. Um, I will say that a, a helpful tip that you just showed, actually, the rolling the CEUs um, mm. from the workshop to the regular course, we will right. definitely make use of yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, that is something I learned just from today. So that is a right. wonderful thing. Right. We uh, In the future, we would probably also make use of the time on the drop-down menu as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. We were in such a hurry doing things that uh, the yeah, fact I that know. we just got it up and going, we we were so ecstatic. It, is. <laughs> it was, it was so monumental to, at the time. Give a give applause for just being able to pull that out of the fire. So, so. do you see Tim's question there? Maybe a wish list item. The wait the, list feature for workshops. Wait list features for workshops. Yes, right now there is no. Uh, there is no option for waitlisting in a given workshop, and again, I guess our thinking was that basically you, uh, the student has multiple options uh, in a workshop. Uh, I suppose that one could uh, 
Well, I don't know how you'd do it. Uh, you'd have to create a secondary set of workshops that would be something like uh, WLAA01, and it would be waitlist for such and such. But the problem is, well, there's no way we can easily manage that. They would just display uh, on the list. So, yeah, waitlisting workshops would be uh, a challenge, and uh, we'd need to look at that. A uh, question was asked there, now that we got some good discussions uh, on this, um, the question was, where do you set the minimum number of workshops they have to participate in in order to check out? Under your course, ACE Web Info, it's over here under the minimum number of workshops required. So again, that, that's where you set that up. So. Um, and again, Tim, Tim's got a number of good suggestions. Tim, yeah, right now, uh, if, if you'd want to give a buzz sometime, we could brainstorm, but yeah, there isn't a native way to do waitlisting on, on workshop sessions. So, um, I was, for those of you that have not used workshops, let me just show you real quick under the workshop uh, reporting area again. These are the kind of reports under the workshop roster, a two-up roster, admission ticket, name badge and ticket, uh, different size tickets, and then of course, just a standard roster, uh, which we'll see if we can run. We got a couple of seconds here. So that it shows, here's the course, workshop one, workshop two, workshop three, with the enrollments they're in. And then the other report under workshops, I said, is more the enrollment summary, which is just kind of show me the number of enrollments in a workshop. So here's a program, and there's enrolled, enrolled, enrolled uh, in a given workshop. So, well, Sharon, uh, and again, uh, great, uh, great set of questions. Uh, Taryn, I'm going to let you and Sharon sign off on that. Okay, Chuck, can oh, you bet. show us bet. what's coming well, next I, month? I forgot one more, one, right. more uh, one more slide in that we're not done oh, we're not done with with the uh, system. I, and again, I would invite you if you've got other ways that you've workshopped, uh, send us a note. We'll send that back to the group. I love this creative way, of course, of doing hot dogs. Um, but again, next month we will wrap up. 2020 with a numbers session, discovering statistical reports, so forth. So. Yep, and folks, send me your ideas. Send me your ideas for how you keep people engaged so I can get those to our questioner. I'm going to send, Nancy, I'm going to send you some things I saw at the LEARN conference that I thought were pretty interesting. So with that, send us your ideas and how you're using workshops and your ideas of how to keep people engaged. And we wish you all a very happy Thanksgiving next week and enjoy the upcoming weekend. Thanks so much, Taryn. We'll talk to you in just a little bit. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.